Now, are you dealing with a co-parent in a custody situation and you're just about ready to lose your mind because that co-parent is a narcissist or maybe that person has a high conflict personality and you just maybe want to pull your hair out or bang your head against the wall, that might actually feel better than dealing with a, co a, a, a co-parenting situation with a narcissist, right? Well, there's good reason for that. So let me give you some statistics. Statistics show that 40 million Americans are currently co-parenting with a, uh, another person right now, not necessarily with a narcissist, but 40 million Americans are co-parenting children who are under the age of 18 right now, just in the United States. According to an article written by Brie Bonche, licensed clinical social worker in the magazine Psych Central, approximately 6% of any population has narcissistic personality disorder. And another 3.3% has no conscience, a lack of empathy. So combined, that's 9.3%. If you take 9.3% of 40 million Americans, you're now at roughly 3.7 million Americans are co-parenting with either somebody who has narcissistic personality disorder or potentially has no conscience, no empathy, uh, something like that. So if you take those statistics and you apply them to the world's population, obviously it's going to be a lot more than that even. So, uh, you know, billions of people are probably co-parenting with a high conflict or toxic personality. And it just makes it so difficult, so difficult because obviously your children are, are the things that mean the most to you. I mean, that's there's nothing m more close to your heart than your children. And so when you're dealing with your children, the thing that means the most to you, and then um, you have to co-parent with a toxic personality on top of it, it's almost like more than you can handle. But there are ways to handle it. There are ways to make it more manageable and actually be able to preserve your sanity. So when you're dealing with co-parenting with a narcissist, I always think it's kind of a weird misnomer because co, anything co, means that you're co-operating, that you're working together. And you know anything co, working together with a narcissist is absolutely not possible. I mean, it's, it's a complete misnomer because it's just not possible to co-operate or co-parent when it comes to dealing with a high conflict personality on the other side. They don't want to cooperate with you. In fact, you know, they get off on the fact that they can make you miserable. Um, and, and anything that means the most to you, that's going to be the one thing that the narcissist is going to hone in on and make sure that you don't get, or, or you know, you can, they, because they know that they can get a rise out of you. And so they know that your children are going to be the thing that means the most to you. So that's a perfect and right place for you to have an Achilles heel. Remember, narcissists have no inner sense of value. They have no inner sense of self. So they need to get all of their feeling of value from the external, from the outside. And what we call that sucking of value, that what, what it is that they need, we call that narcissistic supply. And narcissistic supply can be anything that feeds their ego. So it can be things like what you would think of, like having lots of money or a big important job or having a prestigious position somewhere or being friends with the right people or living in the right neighborhood and, you know, all of those external things. The other way, though, that narcissists get supply is by getting people to squirm, by getting a, re a, a reaction out of them, by controlling them by devaluing, debasing, and degrading people, they get supply out of that too. So if they know that you love your children, which they know you do, then that's a perfect thing for them to get supply from because they know they can get an emotional reaction out of you. So it's this sick way of actually feeding their need for supply. They need supply 
uh, like people need air. It's oxygen to them. It's breathing. It's survival because they don't feel like they exist unless they are getting this supply. And they smell where they can get supply like, like sharks smell blood in the water. It's like vroom right there. And, and so they know that your children are going to be your Achilles heel. So boom, there, there goes the shark coming after the blood in the water, coming right after you to try to make your life miserable using your children all along the way. So how does one co-parent with a narcissist? Well, the first thing that you need to do is realize that they're not going to change. They're not going to change at all. And so no amount of, hey, you're hurting the children, or don't you see what your behavior is causing, or you know, trying to reason with them or show them that, hey, you, you said something the other day and now you're contradicting what you're saying, that you're wasting your time, wasting your breath, wasting your energy. And more importantly, that, that, that kind of thing just starts to suck at your soul because you're, you're putting something into a black hole that you're never going to get any satisfaction from. So don't bother trying to get them to see reason. You're never going to be able to overlay reason onto a narcissist. It just ain't, ain't ever going to fit. So the first thing you can do for yourself, your sanity, and your children is to realize that they're not going to change. When they do the things that they're going to do, don't be surprised. Don't go, oh my God, I can't believe she did that. Oh my goodness, I can't believe he did that. Don't, don't bother with that. Just go, yeah, I can believe it. That's what they do. That, that's what narcissists do. It's like watching a two-year-old have a tantrum on the floor. You're not going to be shocked when a two-year-old has a tantrum. Two-year-olds two have tantrums. Narcissists act like, act like narcissists. They will be their narky selves no matter what. So understand and accepting that, understanding that and accepting that is like the first thing that you can do. So anything that you can do for co-parenting with the narcissist is going to be on your end. Things that you can do to make your life more miserable and, and, and hold them at bay and box them up. Okay, so, so that's number one. So the next thing that you can do is have a really super specific parenting plan. And when I say specific, I mean specific. A lot of people think, oh, you know, we're getting along now, or it's okay, or I don't want to make waves, and we're just going to agree that the kids can go back and forth whenever they want to, or we're basically going to do 50-50, but we're not going to figure out exactly what that means. That's a huge mistake that leaves you open for all kinds of litigation and all kinds of headache down the road. The more detailed, the more specific you can be, the better it will be for you in the long run. The more, the more specific you can be, the better it will be for you in the long run. You will save yourself a lot of headache. And what I mean by specific is have details in there exactly about what are you doing during the week? Where will the ch children be? Are you picking them up from one particular place? Where is it going to be? What time? Who's driving there to pick them up? Um, one of the other things I recommend when it comes to parenting plans is maybe consider parallel parenting. That means that you have as little interaction with the other side as possible, meaning that you know, you're going to have everything all set up so that the exchanges maybe take place at school. You drop off on a Monday at 7 a.m. And, and the other one picks up at on Monday at 3, 3 p.m. And you never have to interact with that other person. Um, and, you know, so the, the minimal amount of interaction uh, possible is, is best. When you're looking at the parenting plan, also remember details around uh, holidays, Monday holidays. How are you going to handle schedule changes? Make sure that's written in there. Um, uh, special days that are important to you, birthdays. If, if trick-or-treating is really important, make sure that there's something um, in there about that. Um, vacations, a as specific as you possibly can. And even times, like if there's a, you know, like the holiday vacation in December, you know, if you're going to split it, say, you know, the first seven days until 3 p.m. goes with mom, and then dad gets 3 p.m. on December 26th through January 2nd or, or something to that effect. 
the more, more detail equals less headache down the road and the less interaction with each other, the better. The next thing you can do is have super strict boundaries. And one way that you can do this is limit the way that you communicate with each other. So I would suggest you have just one way of communicating with each other and it should not be text and it should not be in person. And it should not be over the phone. It really should be email or a court approved app, uh, you know, a co-parenting app of some sort. Um, the reason why I say that is because these kinds of communication are easily transferable into trial exhibits down the road if you end up needing a trial exhibit down the road. So um, because they have date stamps, they have time stamps, they, the full conversation is there. You can use text messages, but it ends up being screenshots and you can't always see uh, what time they were sent or when they were sent and sometimes people cut and paste them. Court approved apps are great because you can, the whole conversation is there, everything is there. What you will wanna do though is make sure that you agree to do using this app or, or the email or whatever form you use in writing, signed by both of you, and then also turned into a court order. Same thing with the parenting plan, by the way, because once it's rendered into a court order, either an order or a final judgment, then you will have some teeth. You will be giving the judge some teeth to enforce it down the road when that narcissist doesn't comply and fails to um, do what they're supposed to do according to the parenting plan, which they undoubtedly will do. They undoubtedly will violate the parenting plan or the order for the app or email or whatever it is because they are narcissists and they can't help themselves. If this is sounding really familiar to you so far, give me a write on in the comments. The next thing you will want to do is document, document, document. And I say this, I've said this over and over and over again, I cannot say this enough. Um, if you are using a, a court approved app, sometimes those apps have private places to put notes sections if you wanna just keep notes in there. Or you can use the notes section of your smartphone. I uh, just would be careful about that. Make sure that your cloud devices are all synced up and you know where the passwords are and you know where they're being shown so that nobody can be reading what you're writing. But you do want to keep notes on every little thing, um, including the most mundane details. You know, what time did the other parent pick up the children? Uh, were they late? Uh, did they ask to change the schedule? Did they not show up? Did they show up impaired? Did they show up bringing a girlfriend? Did they, do they always have the, their parents watching the kids when, when, when they're there? You know, all these mundane little details because one detail alone may not seem to be anything, but over time, these mundane details end up showing patterns and those patterns can end up becoming really strong leverage down the road for your court case and potentially turn into really great trial exhibits. The next thing you can do is keep your emotions in check. This is part of my matter method, by the way, which is e, the E in matter is, stands for keep your emotions in check. And this is because one of the ways that narcissists get supply, remember, is to rile you up, get you excited, get you angry, make you upset, because then they get supply from that. They get off on that, literally. And so the, the, they'll, they'll, figure out, they'll try to figure out ways to get under your skin. They're going to be sending you written correspondence that says, you know, you're a deadbeat dad, or you're a neglectful mom, or you're an alcoholic, or whatever it is that they know is going to upset you because they want to goad you into writing something back that's going to be just as emotional or just as awful or even worse. And so remember, by the way, side note, every single text, writing, anything you put your hand to, any social media post becomes a potential trial exhibit. So if you don't wanna see it again, don't send it, don't write it, don't post it, okay? And this goes hand in hand with keeping your emotions in check. Don't try to justify, don't overshare, don't, don't defend yourself. 
you know, just say, I disagree with your characterization and you can pick up Johnny at 3 p.m. on Wednesday. Just, just the facts, stick to the facts. Don't take the bait because that's exactly what they want you to do. Overall, just remember what I said at the beginning of this video, narcissists cannot change. They won't change. Um, it's just, they're, they're never, they're like wild animals. They're never going to be tamed, but you can build a fence around them so that, you know, you feel like they're more contained. And by doing that, it'll make it a little bit easier for you to co-parent with this narcissist. It'll never be a breeze, but it'll be a little bit easier, which will help preserve your sanity and also the quality of your life and your children's lives as well. Whichever one of you wants to jump in and start, I would love for you to share your story. Sure. So um, I'm just so somebody goes first. Um, I was with my ex for about 14 years in total, married for 10. We have two kids. It was um, a very, very stormy, challenging, difficult relationship almost from the start. Um, my divorce, which began in 2014, took three years and cost me $300,000 for like no, no good reason. We ended up at the end uh, pretty much where we started um, with some minor, minor details that switched. And what really changed things, um, and this By was a big way, part. I just want to say, as an attorney, I have seen that happen so many times. And I just tell people often, some people just need to be beat up by the process, right? They just don't believe you at the beginning that that's where you're going to end up because some people just have these like ridiculous things that they're going to go and the judge is going to hear their story and the heavens are going to open up and, and it's all going to be like, oh my God, I can't believe that that's what you had to deal with. And, and they think that it's all going to go and it's like a certain way or whatever, right? And because they are hmm, narcissists, <laughs> right? Yeah. yeah. And the, so, and the system feeds into it too, because you have the psychological profiles, you have all those, the evaluators and all those people, Lisa always calls it a, a feeding frenzy. And you're a hundred percent right. When, um, when we'll do discovery calls with people who set appointments with us and we start talking a lot of times, they'll say, my situation is so crazy. And Lisa and I are like, okay, go ahead. Like we've, we've heard it all. We've lived it all <laughs> and all that, but um, really where our coaching practice, our book, the whole thing came from was a conversation. It was, uh, I had just met Lisa. I met Lisa while, while I was um, in the earlier stages, first year of my divorce. And, um, and, and I said to her, you know, we, we had learned so much. And if I could go back in time and redo everything, I could easily save half that money, half that time. Who knows how much emotional turmoil and fear and like my role as a dad and all of that stuff. I mean, that was a horrific experience. And we said, well, it's, you know, there's no time machine. You can't go back and fix what I did wrong. But we had learned at that point how many people are facing these problems or just getting chewed up in the system, suffering from legal abuse and all that. So we can't undo or redo our own uh, situations, but we can help others with it. And that's where, that's where, where this all started. And it started as a book project. And then that kind of got put on hold because somebody, a very, very wise um, a literary agent said, you should get into, do coaching, do the book, but use the book to promote the coaching. And so we got into coaching and that just took off. And we even, we underestimated how big a need there was for this kind of, this kind of support and this, the strategist role that we play um, to sort of work along with the therapists and the attorneys and all the other professionals who are involved because the cases are so crazy. Mm, very wise advice. And I, you know, I, I heard a, a saying one time, you are best served to help the people with it, the person that you used to be. Exactly. Yeah. yeah right. And so I, I think that was a very, uh, whoever that was, was a wise person and it's always out of your trauma becomes your transformation. And, and, and it's so, it's so wonderful when you can look in the eyes of a person and go, Oh, I see you. I know you, I see your pain, but I know it. I know that pain. 
right? And 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 then have that person feel like, oh my God, that person does know me. The person does understand. And yeah, the one the one we love is um uh turn your mess into your message. Yeah. And we get that a lot. A lot of people reach out to us and they'll say, Well, I want to write a book or I wanna I want my story heard. Mm -hmm. I want to get into advocacy and all that. And it's sure. great. It's wonderful. It's well intentioned. But what Lisa and I will say to them is let let others carry the torches and pitchforks for now. Go win your case. That's the best thing you can do. And if you want to get into advocacy later, like we're a hundred percent behind you. Yeah, yeah, for sure, for sure. So, and and you had how old were your children when you first started in in your divorce? Two two boys, ten and seven. Ten and seven, and so yep, they had to at the time go through all of that with you. And and they're 20 and 17 now. And as Lisa mentioned earlier, our our situations are very, very different. She can touch on that a little bit. But I co-parent, I share about 50-50 custody. Obviously, my older one, he's in college, he's aged out. And I have less than a year left in terms of like the custody part of it um, with my younger one. But it was a, it's been like the back and forth every week and all of that, a lot of involvement, a lot of uh, engagement and having to enforce boundaries and things like that. But Lisa's story is very different. So are you able to co-parent peacefully? Nope. <laughs> <laughs> no, it's, it's been, um, I always use the analogy of, um, like picture a, a, a rancher who has a thousand acres that is cattle roam every day. And he has to ride the perimeter fence every single day because overnight somebody's cut the fence, somebody's broken, broken in narcissists hate boundaries mm -hmm. and mine is no exception she's always finding some new way in i've i mean it's 10 years later at this point so i've i've basically repaired the i've replaced the fence with like a 10 foot brick wall <laughs> so it's a yeah. lot more my boundaries are a lot better today but it was all this like oh my god she found this other way to interfere with my parenting time or cause chaos when lisa and i first got together uh, as a romantic couple, which nobody wants to hear about right now, um, she, her comment to me was, "You're not emotionally available because anytime my ex would say, you know, it's it's nine thirty on a Tuesday evening, and we're sitting holding hands on the wall by her house, and 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 she's, uh, my ex will say like, our son needs his medication, you have to come over right now, and I I would be like jumping, like I better, you know, you walk on eggshells in the relationship." You walk on eggshells to make sure you don't go, don't get in trouble even after the divorce. Oh, I know, I know. I mean, I told you this before we went on the air I mean, when, when we had our pre-call that I have a family member who it took him six years to get through his divorce. But, you know, he would say, you know, if it was a 6 p.m. drop off that he would wait around the corner to drop off right at the dot of 6 p.m., because if he dropped off late, he was a deadbeat and early he was a stalker. So <laughs> it was like right on the dot of 6 p.m., you know, but that was kind of part of the, the conditioning because he was, oh my God, I don't want to have to hear about it. Right. Yeah. So, yeah. Um, okay. So let's hear from you now, Lisa. Okay. Yeah. So I had a very different experience. I was with my ex for about 20 years, married for about 18. And, um, we didn't fight a lot. It seemed very calm and peaceful. And then I found out that he was living a double life the entire time. And so when things started to come out, it was like, oh my God. And we went through couples counseling. I, my biggest fear was, um, how this would affect the kids. And I felt like if I divorced him, that I would be breaking up the family and ruining their lives. And that was used to keep me in the relationship, even though it just got worse and worse. And at some point it got more painful to stay than to go. And it, it took about two years of planning. Um, and then when we finally decided, I thought, okay, this is going to be really amicable because we've had two years we've tried and clearly it's, it's not working. So when I filed papers, I met, I, I had my first consult. I immediately knew the attorney and I were a, a match, but he said, yours is going to be really bad. I was like, how do you know this? And of course I interviewed him for the book later, but in 20 minutes, the, the things I was describing were in my head. I thought, well, my ex is a good guy. He's just done some bad things. 
my attorney Eric was like, no, 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 these this signals high conflict divorce, which of course, who who would know? So, and in our book, we have a whole chapter about some of those factors that indicate a high conflict divorce. And Eric was totally right. In my state of Connecticut, when you file, they set a trial date for a year from that point. So there's a deadline. We went right up until two weeks beforehand. And my divorce also cost $100,000, which was insane when I thought, oh my gosh, I don't have $10,000, so I can't leave. And now I'm going to be paying these debts back for, for life. But anyway, um, so I thought we would, you know, have this amicable situation. I was looking forward to having some weekends to myself. I have two kids at the time. They were, I think, 11 and 14 ish. And um, but my ex just walked out on. He said, he said, if you if you divorce me, I'm not going to pay for the kids college. And this was something that was very important to me. And I thought to our family. I'm an educator. I'm my background is in teaching. And I just was like, how, how would you, how dare you do something like that? You know, that's not harming me. That's harming the kids. Um, and when he left, he basically left all of us. He said, uh, he gave my son his library card and his YMCA card and threw it on the table and said, I guess I'm done with this. I don't need this anymore. And I was like, wow, like, wow. So he left and just, that was it. And then he kind of came back. He was doing, you know, you can imagine what kinds of behaviors these people have and they're thinking about themselves and what makes them happy and et cetera. And, um, and I got immediately got my kids into therapy. And then by the time my ex was ready, you know, had his, had his little fun and it didn't work out and he wanted to sort of um, re-engage with the kids, they were fed up and their therapists were involved and he was unwilling to really uh, commit to uh, therapy with them. How long? And how long was that in between? Uh, it was about nine months, and then uh, we tried. We tried after a year. I mean, I wished that he was there because I wanted a break. I was like, I didn't want to be a sole parent. I kept thinking, like, how come he doesn't want to take the kids? Like, I, I couldn't understand. Um, you know, I knew he was like dating and doing all his things, but I just kept thinking, what, what about the kids? Like, I thought he valued our, our children and our family. So I was astonished and, um, it was really well, hard. We used to, sorry. We used to talk about this all the time when we were in the early years of our relationship, which was like, you know, who has it worse, right? I, I have, I have my kids half the time, approximately, I have to be engaged with this toxic ex and we'll say co-parent, it's not really co-parenting, um, but I get a break, right? Because um, half the time they're with her. Lisa um, doesn't have to deal with any of the, I mean, in court, yes, but as a, in terms of co-parenting, doesn't have to deal with her ex, but she's a full-time single mom, like all the time, she never gets a break. Right, so, so as we call it, the sole parent. Plus you had to deal with the fact that he just abandoned all of you and well, the kids, I mean, I didn't feel abandoned, but the kids, I was just like, how, how could you just not consider the kids at all? He moved in with his father. There were no overnights. There were no requests for visit. We did mediation. We came up with a parenting plan and he had all these days. He just never, he just never came. I mean, so the hardest. So amazing. That's I know. so incredible. I can't yeah. even imagine. That's I know. The hardest part for me was dealing with the emotional fallout for the kids yeah, that's and what I, mean. that's I couldn't I didn't know crazy. how to explain somebody who had been physically present their whole lives who just was like I'm I'm done so um anyway you know the divorce took forever and I kept thinking like this is crazy and then it's now been this is the beginning of the decade year 10 and I have been in court with him mainly because he does not comply with the agreement and, um, you know, it was an agreement. We didn't have to go to trial for that, for the divorce itself. We've been to trial a lot since then. But I figured since I can't force him to be a parent to these children, the least I can do is make sure he honors his financial obligation to them. And so that's what I've been doing is making sure that he did, in fact, contribute to their college education, that he did pay child support and alimony, which he decided he didn't feel like paying, even though he had agreed to it. And that's what all these years in court have really been about, is trying to make sure that that agreement is followed. And um, 
I always say that it took a long time for justice to be served. And we always know that people in these situations feel like they get away. How do they get away with this stuff for so long? He got away with stuff for a long time. And then it hit him really, really hard. And I think he had attorneys that were um, enabling him and saying, oh, you know, we're going to wear her down. She's going to get tired of it. She's by herself could because I didn't have an attorney representing me for, for the majority of this. Um, and they were just really wrong. And and it's just so sad because in this process of him, I feel like um, financially abusing the kids to get to me, he's he's destroyed his relationship. And he doesn't seem to understand that like he was punishing the kids. Like I've moved on with my life. I was at peace when we got the divorce. And um, it's just really hard to fathom. You know, sometimes we wonder what's in these people's heads, but then we remember they have they have some issues. So it's hard. We can't project our own values onto them. So anyway, in a nutshell, a big nutshell, that's my situation. Wow. Wow. So, so interesting and both so sad. I mean, because, in it, you know, it just demonstrates how in in two different, completely different ways, how narcissists will always put themselves first, even before their children. Yeah. Yeah. And so many people like Lisa touched on um, how long it took the stamina she had to have to make it through that legal process so that justice could be served. Eventually, I cannot tell you how many times I sat in one of those little conference, tiny conference rooms while she went into court and we're thinking today's the day. They're going to finally see it. It's finally going to happen today. And she'd come out with her head hung low, shaking her head. Was, oh my gosh. Like how, how, how did this happen? How did he still how, like get to delay it again or stretch things out? And like Lisa said, their goal is to wear you down and bleed you dry financially, figuring that you'll, you'll give up. Oh, and so I remember. People do. So yeah, I, I remember a particularly astonishing thing um, while we were in court trying to figure out the educational support order. So the college, how we were going to do the college. And we had it took a year and about eight court appearances to, for me to get that educational support order. And so my son had started college at a private university. And so um, my ex was supposed to reimburse me his share and he just didn't. And so I went back to court and said, he's, he's not paying. If he doesn't pay his share, then our son has to drop out of the school because I can't afford to, to keep him in a private college. And we already have this order. And the judge said repeatedly to my ex, sir, if you don't pay, if you don't pay back, do you understand that your son is going to have to drop out of college? And it happened like it, he allowed it to happen. The court didn't force you know, the penalties in time. And my son had to leave that college. And luckily he was able to transfer to a state school, but it was just like, people think that, you know, what matters to normal parents, like, look, if you don't do this, your son's going to drop out. But with a narcissist or someone like that, they're glad they're like, oh, I can control that. I can punish my son and therefore harm my ex-wife. Let it happen. And it happened. And I think over the years, we we did have several judges, but there was one judge that was on the case. And I think they just sort of were shaking their heads like, what kind of parent does this? And we always think about child's best interest, which doesn't even relate to college. But like, what kind of parent behaves like this to their own children? Mm. Yes. So it goes back to what I constantly say. And I, I always tell people that there is a hierarchy to narcissistic supply which is that diamond level versus coal level. And you know, people always say narcissists just want to win. They just want to win. But that's not true. Winning is only image related. And that coal level supply is that manipulation, the manipulation. And they want both. They want to win. They want the image, but they also want the manipulation. And, and so I always tell people, you have to create that leverage, which is going to threaten that, that image threaten that source of supply that's more important for them to keep than the supply that they get from manipulating you. And that's the only way that you will get them to stop. Because if you don't do that, then they will never leave you alone. They will never leave you alone. Because clearly you're seeing what's going on here, right? They don't care about children. They only care about their image. 
They only care about their image. And, and so, and, you know, in your case, I guess, judge was not the, the image that they cared about. So you got to figure out where's the image. Sometimes judges, it, it is a good source of supply for them, right? They don't want to look bad in front of a judge. But if that's not the source of supply that they care about, then you got to figure out what that is and create leverage around that, right? So, um, so going back to this, you know, and I want to just create some do's and don'ts here for people who are trying to co-parent or counter-parent, whatever it is, with a toxic ex, you know, early on in, the, in their situation, some do's and don'ts, I would say, and I think you guys would agree, don't believe them when they say, oh, I just want to settle this amicably. <laughs> <laughs> oh, oh yeah <laughs> how that about the one big... of like yeah oh we don't we don't need lawyers like yeah. let's we need to save money so yeah. let's just do it ourselves but you yeah. know what i have this is really easy yeah. let's just you sign that you don't need to see anything just let's agree and we'll right be or we just it. need we don't need a specific agreement we'll just put this in here we just we're both gonna get half the time right we don't need a, a specific agreement, right? Yeah, that, that was a big part of like when my, and by the way, my ex left me, not the other way around, which thank goodness was the greatest thing she ever did for me because I would never have left that relationship. I don't think, um, and it's, a, I always talk about how resilience is a wonderful trait, but in overabundance, it keeps you in these horrific relationships. But when she did leave, she talked about it as if we'll have dinner at each other's houses. We're going to do this. We're going to do that. It'll, it'll be just like when we were together, except we, we won't be. And, and oddly, um, and I didn't figure this out really until later when she left me, she didn't file for divorce. She filed for custody only. And it wasn't until almost a year later that I was like, this is ridiculous. Like I, we're getting divorced. Right. So I filed for divorce, which is, that was a whole other just oh, add to all the yeah. expense, just chaos. It was that's another chaos. big do's and don'ts thing is not to do the divorce in parts. Hmm. Um, that's another thing that I see a big mistake on. Mm -hmm. uh, and I just was did a, a, a call with somebody on this. They did they um they had already done the divorce, they were already divorced, and 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 now they had already done the um like they'd already given the house to the person and and now that the only thing left was like the custody piece and and so they had no leverage left mm. had no leverage right. left because the person was already moved in with their new supply they had everything they already wanted sure so you, got, you got to hold you back just, you just hit on two you're talking about mistakes right yeah. Um, one is, is a lot of people come to us and uh, like with me, with me, it wasn't about money. It was about custody. It was about my role as a dad. Um, and so we see so many people who say, I'll, I'll give, I'll give on the financial side. I just want custody. I want favorable custody terms. And then, so they settle, right. And they get reasonably good custody terms and they give up everything financially. And then guess what? Two years later, the other party goes back and looks for a modification to custody and gets 50-50 anyway. So that's that's one we see. And then the other you already touched on is, um, is underestimating your ex and what they're capable of mm -hmm. and thinking, well, it didn't work out. Like approaching it like a normal divorce where there's a trajectory of, yeah, they're pissed off. There's, resent, there's a, some resentment there. There's something toward a marriage apart that wasn't intended to be torn apart but reasonable people on a normal divorce trajectory calm down after six months nine months 12 months maybe a little longer when the bills start piling up and they've calmed down they've they've um they've moved on in some ways and they're like okay this is ridiculous let's put the kids first and they work through it and it can be okay um in these situations my it just ramps up and up and up and for a long time 
like mine got worse and worse and worse for years, even after the divorce was over. Yes, that's so true. That's such a good point. That's such a good point. The other thing also about narcissists is that you think um, that if you give something like it's it just something that you just said that made me think of it like, oh, I'll give the financials and then they'll see how good I am and they'll see how giving I've been and then they'll give on this other thing. They're not, they don't see that. They'll, they just take, they just go, well, I, I was entitled to that anyway. That was right. mine. Right. Well, the moving I, goalposts, right? I, well, I made all that money. That right. was my money. So right. um, you didn't give me anything. Right. I, I, I love the quote. Um, what's mine is mine. And what's yours is mine too. Yes. And yeah. it makes me think back of when, when I was still with my ex. Um, I mean, I had been a teacher, but then I became a stay at home mom for a while and I still was working, but I had these entrepreneurial situations. So he had the steady job with the 401k. So he's like, let's just start socking money into my retirement and use your money to pay the household bills. And my retirement is going to be our retirement because I'm going to share it. Well, you know what happened? Like my money's gone. And then he's got this huge retirement. And then for the settlement, it's like, no, he keeps his retirement. Right. And so even if you had said, oh, you know, keep your retirement. And I just one time with the kids, he'd have been like, well, it was my retirement anyway. Yeah, he was. So <laughs> <laughs> exactly. As oh, well as his like, 14 rental properties that was like, oh, no, those are mine. Those are mine, too. Yeah. Even even if the law provided that you got half of it. Mm -hmm. right? They wouldn't see like, oh, that you were being so giving, so kind. And then there you would have given away your leverage. Yeah. So right. they, they're not, so don't do that. Don't do that early on. And and especially when you have those, oh, we don't need lawyer conversations that early on at the beginning. Oh, let's just settle this amicably. And, and even if you have one of those conversations sort of casually, They'll try to hold you to it. Yeah. Yeah, for sure. And you you talk, I mean, your your book goes way in depth on the negotiation side. We always tell our people, like, you, you never, ever give anything of value without getting something of value in return, right? My one, by the way, my one criticism of your book is that you didn't write it 10 years earlier when it could have made a difference. <laughs> in, in, oh, you're funny. Yeah, in, oh. in my divorce, because it's yeah. time machine stuff. Yeah. So, um, so let's talk um, more about, um, you know, trying to deal with a, a, a toxic ex. And um, I know, Chris, you're still in it a bit too. And, you know, for people who now it's after the final judgment and they are, you know, and I see this all the time too, you know, there's not everything can be written in there. Not everything can be written in there. And they are feeling like they're still getting away with it. They're still constantly finding those cracks, finding those crevices, finding those ways to get away with something, finding those ways to make your life miserable in, in some way, you know, whether it's, um, not paying for a certain thing or not allowing um, the children to come to the birthday party or not, you know, whatever it is. Um, what would you say to them? Well, I mean, if it's too late, I mean, one of the things we try to encourage our people to do, our community and our clients, is if you have a parenting plan, you need to make sure it is as detailed as possible. And think through, especially if you have a little kids, think through their entire childhoods all the way up to 18, right? Um, if you have gray language in there, any, I, I always say the devil's in, de in the details. I even have a, a little slide I show for that. Um, they will take advantage of any gray language, any ambiguity at all to torture you with it. Um, deadlines, consequences, you need those things in there, not... Um, you get Thanksgiving in odd years and I get Thanksgiving in even years, but 
Thanksgiving begins Wednesday at 3 p.m. or or Wednesday after school or 3 p.m. if there's no school, right? Like every little thing needs to be said in, in great detail. And even then there are things um, people put in clauses like uh, right of first refusal, right? And think, oh, good. Well, he's always leaving the kids with the girlfriend. So if I put a right of first refusal in there, um, that'll that'll take care of that situation. Well, no, guess what? Guess how enforceable those those things are? It's very, very hard. Courts don't want to hear it. They 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 like they don't want you there. Yeah, and the word reasonable. Yeah. <laughs> because well, yeah, what they unless it's fluff. What they definitely don't want to hear, what I call aspirational, is like oh, the parent is not supposed to talk badly about the other parent or something like that. I mean, that's just all aspirational because how are you supposed to really enforce that? I mean, you're you're gonna really go running back to the court if somebody actually did say something about the other parent i mean it's really hard right but people uh, see that they see the non-disparagement clause right and they're like but my the, my ex is saying all kinds of things so i'm going to go back to the judge and and then we say well <clears throat> what do you think the judge is going to do what are you going to well, ask the judge to do well that's the thing so that's <laughs> why those the, that's why i call it aspirational because the the, the what the, the agreements have to have are teeth in it, right? And and you have to have teeth in your agreement for the things that actually do matter, you know, such as if they don't comply with certain um, parts of the agreement, right? So, and one of the things that I do, it, you just mentioned, and I, I do want to make sure I say, because I just had this conversation with actually somebody on my team yesterday, uh, and, and that is, if you don't have a default provision for fees in your agreement, make sure that you do if you haven't signed your agreement yet, because if you don't, it really is so much harder for you. And, and it really is a disincentive for them, uh, for sure. I mean, to to um, to to not comply. I mean, it, you, you know, you want them to comply. It, and, and if they if they think that they're going to have to pay not only their own fees, but your fees too, if they default, it will incentivize them to want to comply with the agreement. Right. right. And, and so many, so many people think they're covered when they put like may, may be, you know, the, the party that is, that loses may be responsible for reasonable attorney's fees. Yeah, well, yeah. The, yeah. no, how about shall be shall. responsible for shall. actual attorney's yes. fees. Yes. Yeah. Yeah. I mean, it's still, there's still always going to be a reasonable this conversation anyway, um, just because that's the law, but at least it, it has to be awarded and, and, and it doesn't give the judge that latitude of, oh, you know, because a lot of judges are reticent to give fees, but if it's contractual and it's in your MSA, or in you know the the custody agreement or whatever it is that's in your state, then the judge doesn't have the latitude to say no. Right, and that's that single word like may versus shall. Mm -hmm. It can make all the difference. That's what made it easier for me to get the modification when I went back after the divorce on my own pro se because the language that my attorney I always say he put protective language in. That said, if we find this out, then it shall be interpreted as this and shall trigger that. And it happened. But it, boy, it's a lot of arguing about it. But the judge said it says it right here. And make sure it, it's it says defaulting, shall. defaulting party, not prevailing party. Because, mm. when it, because there's a big difference between they just defaulted and then they prevailed. Because when do they prevail? Right. You know, when they've already gone out all the way to the Supreme Court for, you know, to to uh to 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 uh you know um appeal it or whatever i mean you want to make sure that it's just all they did was default like Ooh, that's good to know did they did they do what they said they were gonna no they didn't okay they defaulted hmm, i just learned something thank you rebecca yeah yeah that's great you don't want to wait till they actually prevailed mm -hmm. well i mean your your original question had to do with after right after the agreements are in place and i started to answer by saying we'll make sure this is in the agreement which kind of skirted your question 
and and your question was a really really important one because once you're out of the legal system so many people feel this okay relief like that's over and it's really just starting not necessarily on the legal one. side divorce right? is part one just yeah part one. yeah so there's so much that to, to be done uh to combat the the other the counter parents or the the other sides um attempts to undermine your relationship with your kids that doesn't involve the court where you were talking about disparagement before so many of them are so good and so subtle in their undermining of your relationship with your children that it it's not hey your dad's terrible it's hey like um i think of an example from um from my own situation my older son uh, so played the you know the upright bass that giant bass in orchestras the huge huge instrument and so one year for christmas i got him an electric bass thinking how cool is that like he's got the skills it's just you know it's different it's a different instrument but how fun would that be to let him play like rock music and and stuff like that and his mother um from her own home told him he's not allowed to use that bass until he achieves certain goals with his classical bass so he didn't touch this christmas present for two years mm -hmm. yeah what do you do with that i mean that's her manipulating the child to take away a gift that i gave him for christmas that was a special gift and the courts like, can't do anything yeah. and there's lots i have so many examples of stuff like that yeah yeah i mean it's just just a little subtle way of uh, and, and just, oh well i was just trying to make sure that he had discipline mm -hmm. i was just yeah. trying to uh, make sure that he was learning and I, uh, what what <laughs> you know and, and they just act all innocent uh, what do you have you have you met my ex <laughs> 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 yeah, but that's undermining the other parent's authority. And there's a, a what? number of ways that happens. What? Yeah. I, I mean, you know, they're so good at that. So good at that. Yeah. Um, but but that's the kind of thing that they do. And so what would you say? Because I hear this question a lot about to a a, a parent who is worried that their child is going to turn out narcissistic like the other parents. Mm, we hear that a lot too. We just did a whole webinar on, on this topic, the beginning of this topic. And that involved um, when, you're, when your ex is putting poisonous messages into your kids' heads or trying to turn them against you, which we know often starts while you're still in the relationship because with narcissists and people with personality disorders, there's that whole loyalty thing. Like you're with me or you're against me. So with kids after a divorce, it's if you love me as your parent, then you need to hate or discard the other parent. So kids unfortunately get stuck in the middle and the toxic parent will do all, all kinds of things where they will reward certain behaviors and punish other behaviors. So we, we have a client who was telling us that her daughter would eavesdrop on her conversations with work. And um, she has a she has a good tip paying job and her daughter would report back to the father post-divorce. I think mom's making more money. And so the mom said, why are you doing this to her daughter? Why are you telling dad things like that? And the and the girl said, Well, when I when I say bad things about you, mom, that's that's the only time he pays attention to me. So we have to remember that kids in these situations are victims of domestic violence themselves. They are being emotionally manipulated and they can appear like little narcissists and it is really scary. Um, but you have to remember that that often they're they're doing what's called fawning. They're trying to figure out a way to survive. We can separate from that person and live in our own place and get away from them, but the kids are the ones who still have to go back and forth. And so often they they learn what they have to do to function in each household. And sometimes they will take messages from the other parent and come back and say, dad said this about you or mom said this about you. And it can be very inflammatory and it can stir up all kinds of triggers because it's like they're doing the same behavior that my toxic ex did. And now I feel like I hate my kid. Like I'm, I'm there's like another little narc and what do I do? 
Um, and there's a lot that people have to do to learn to what's called self-regulate, to figure out what their own triggers are, to realize, okay, this is this is a child. Um, there's a lot of other things going on just because they're behaving this way doesn't mean that they're a little narcissist, even though they're behaving like this, but there might be reasons for it. For example, your ex could be saying these things to your kids, asking to, to see what the kid says about your reaction to it. So basically baiting you by proxy. And so when you get inflamed, the kid goes back and says, oh, this is how my other parent reacted. And they get rewarded for that. Also, young kids and even teenagers learn um, a, a really bad dynamic, whereas they don't have a lot of control or agency in their own lives, especially as they're going back and forth between, uh, unfortunately, an unhealthy parent and sometimes a not very healthy parent either because of what's going on. And so when they say things and get you really upset, that gives them a sense of supply and a sense of power for negative behavior. So that's why it's really important to be as calm. And I know this is not easy and this involves a lot of work and is a much bigger conversation, but to be as calm as possible so that when they come at you and act like really inappropriately, you you just are like, no, you know, that's not how you're going to talk to me. This is what we're going to do and act like, you know, kind of like learn to gray rock with your own kids where you don't let them get to you like that because it's, it's feeding that same negative behavior. Remember, kids model their parents' behavior. So that child might be modeling what they see at the other home and thinking, oh, I can get away with it here. And unfortunately, a lot of parents, um, they they take it because they feel so guilty over the family not being intact anymore for a variety of reasons. And they're just like, oh my gosh, I don't want to lose my relationship with my kids. So I'm just going to give in or I'm going to tolerate it. Right? I don't see them very often. And it just goes into a really bad direction, but it's a big topic and it's a common fear. Mm -hmm. Yeah. So great answer. Thank you. So how do you guys help people? What's, what, what's your, the way that you guys help people? Chris, you want to start or should I keep talking? Sure. Well, I mean, so people who come to us are usually already in the thick of it before they realize that they need the help. But there are some, so I'll, I'll talk from a practical standpoint. Um, there are about six areas that we really focus on the most. Um, and it, again, these are people who are usually in the legal system, usually like in the process of being worn down and bled dry. So we help them focus their um, their narrative around the things that actually matter not going in and proving to the judge that the person's a narcissist or calling them abusive or focusing on the, their former partner's abuse of them. It's all about, when we're talking custody, it's all about the, the children, right? It's all about what's best for the kids and the best interest factors and all that stuff. So it's it's documenting those things and, and honing their, their narrative in concert with their attorney, unless they're pro se. Um, how to communicate with their ex. Um, there's such a disconnect. We love when our clients have therapists to deal with all the trauma, trauma-informed therapists, but there's a disconnect between the, the therapeutic community and the legal system where a good therapist will say, well, cut off contact, no contact, right? That's the healthiest thing emotionally. I'd love to have been no contact with my ex for the last decade, but boy, that can undermine a custody case for sure. You don't respond to things. You don't involve them in decisions. If you happen to be the one who's who's making the decisions and you just cut them out, uh, that can feel really powerful, but a judge is not going to like that. They want to see you cooperating. So you have to appear to be cooperating. So you have to communicate the right way. Um, presentation, how to be a witness, how to deal with a bully attorney on the other side. They always hire bullies, right? Oh, you know? I always say that narcissists are like uh, owners and dogs. They always find an attorney that looks just yeah. like yeah. I love that. I love that. That's a good one. Yeah. yeah. So it's it's whole presentation that extends to custody evaluators, attorneys for the children. We call them in New York or GALs. Those kinds of people they have that can have such a big say in how custody cases turn out. Um, so also having having strategic oversight of your case. Um, we don't work, we never want to work counter to an attorney. We all, we're all on, on our client's team, right? We're all pulling in the same direction, but only five to 10% of divorce cases are these especially high conflict ones, right? So most attorneys are, are like, wow, this is the craziest case I've ever seen. They don't follow the script. 
So uh, clients need to have a little bit more of a leadership role. My case didn't settle. I told, I mentioned mine took three years, it cost $300,000. It didn't settle until I finally said no more with the negotiations, get a trial date, right? Get, I call it the splat date, right? You just, if you're a recreational, uh, if you jump out of planes, right? And a skydiver, there is a point after you've jumped out of a plane, here comes the earth, right? If you don't pull the ripcord splat, so that that trial date is your splat date, right? If you I put I put it in my do's and don't. I have a five page um, uh, document that I it, that is in my slay program that I hand I tell people to hand to their lawyers, and in my do's and don'ts I I put in there do not send settlement proposals back and forth. Yes. Oh my gosh, you that's money. That is where a lot of my wasted yes. money went. A lot. We spent if you two are, years. If, if you are in uh, with a narcissist, that is the biggest waste of money of yes. all time. Mm -hmm. Absolutely. For both right. of us. Looks our like cases. we've got an agreement. We're going to write it up. And then, nah, I don't agree. It oh, will never. So many times. Yeah. I, even if it's their own proposal and you spend like five days going back and forth. Oh, it's not really what I, what I want, but you know, at least it'll be done. Okay, fine. We'll take it. But by the time you get back, oh, well, that deal is off the table because, well, I don't like your face anymore. But but <laughs> we're going to use that as the starting point for new negotiations. I'm still yeah. at my original point, but that negotiated settlement is now your point. So now we're going to meet halfway of that. Yeah, because you took too long, uh, yeah. whatever it is. But, you know... And even though you went back and took every single point that they said, that deal is off the table. Yep, 100%. Yeah, and then the other things is um, like reviewing parenting plans to look for that gray language. Um, and then the biggest one is afterwards and being functionally co-parenting to the best of your ability day to day, uh, even after you're out of the legal system to help me, help make, I mean, all of us as parents, I think, the goal is to raise kids who have the best chance at a healthy, happy life. Yeah. Happy by whatever their definition is. Yeah. I mean, I do right. think it, you need a parenting coordinator or something like that. Um, if you have a narcissist on the other side, because you just don't want to have to keep going back to court all the time. Um, I do recommend that to people because there's always going to be something, you know, trick or treating or what, I don't know, just something. Some uh, sort of decision-making mechanism that be, goes beyond the two of you just working it out, which is what the courts expect and never happens. How soon after your divorce should you implement a temporary parenting plan? And that question is from Heather. So Heather, thank you for your uh, question. So the first thing I do need to say and make sure that I always say is that uh, I am, you know, I'm only licensed as an attorney in Florida. And so when I give you my advice, it is not legal advice for actual legal advice that pertains to the laws in your state or your country. You should con um, connect with an attorney there in your jurisdiction. But I can tell you generally and give you general information. So with regard to a temporary parenting plan, that's something that you should probably do, especially if you're dealing with a narcissist on the other side, as soon as you possibly can. Uh, I actually had a case one time where the husband had filed for divorce when the wife, who the wife was my client, and he filed for divorce when she was like seven and a half months pregnant. So what we ended up doing was mediating a temporary parenting plan like a week or two before she gave birth to the baby. And that temporary parenting plan is still actually in place and still going because the case is still going. We are actually getting ready to mediate that case again for the final parenting plan at the end of August. But for the whole first year of the baby's life, the, the temporary parenting plan has remained in place. And for, for my client's sake, she has been really happy about that because it didn't give any overnights to the husband. So she has been able to have almost total control of the child for the whole ba the baby's almost first year. So I would recommend that you enter into a temporary parenting plan as soon as you can, because then there's less 
problem, less chance for interaction, less chance for mani manipulation. I would highly recommend that the parenting plan be as specific as possible, which means, you know, Tuesdays and Wednesdays from this time to this time there with, you know, the mother, Wednesdays and Thursdays from this time to this time, you know, whatever it is, have it be super, super specific. And even down to the detail of who's driving the children to where, uh, it, it, you know, it, is the person who's receiving the children driving to pick them up? Is the person who's giving up the children for the next two days, taking them somewhere? And, and, and even specify where the exchanges are going to take place. You know, a lot of times before COVID hit, we would say school, you know, like the kids would be dropped off at school in the morning and then the other parent would pick them up in the afternoon. But with COVID, things are a lot more different. So, you know, make sure that you have that in place. And I would recommend that you at least include the major holidays that are going to be coming up in the next several months, because while you can certainly settle your case sooner, and hopefully you do, if you think that it, it th there's any chance that a major holiday is going to happen before your case is over, it just makes it easier than having to go back to lawyers and try to go back and forth and try to figure out what's going to happen at Christmas or Hanukkah or, you know, some special holiday that really means a lot to the families. So I do recommend that you implement that temporary parenting plan as soon as possible. And sometimes I even say, before you even move out, have that written parenting plan in place, because otherwise it just it causes havoc. And I would include in the temporary parenting plan that it is temporary, that it's not to be used for as a basis for any sort of final parenting plan. And I would include in there some kind of language about if, if one person doesn't do what they say they're going to do, that, um, that the defaulting party or the non-complying party has, uh, is the one that has to pay both sides fees so that there's some sort of incentive to actually do the parenting plan, that there's something that happens if, if the parenting plan isn't um, you know, uh, adhered to by, by both parents. Um, and you might want to put something in there about using a, an app, like a, uh, some sort of like um, Talking Parents or FAIR or Our Family Wizard or Co-Parenter. There's several apps out there. And I would suggest that you put that in the temporary agreement as well. A lot of jurisdictions do recommend that you mediate a temporary parenting plan almost immediately after the, t the divorce is filed. Some jurisdictions say it has to be in place within 30 days or something like that. So some jurisdictions actually, actually require you to enter into a temporary parenting plan right away. So um, those are a few of the things that I would include. And, and that's when I would in, um, go ahead and uh, implement that temporary parenting plan. So Okay, so over the weekend... There was all kinds of a flurry, drama, trauma, chaos in the lives of Kim and Kanye when Kanye posted all kinds of stuff. Well, it was kind of like ostensibly sort of talking to God or something where he was saying, hey, God, help me, help me get my kids to church, specifically North. He wanted to take North to church. He was saying that he was angry because Kim was posting more videos on TikTok and he really doesn't like that. Now, Kim, honestly, he's been saying this for months. He doesn't like that she's posting these videos on TikTok. And, you know, she continues to do that, which is not necessarily a good thing because obviously she's provoking this. She's baiting him too. And this is causing more drama, drama, chaos on his part as well. Apparently there was a flurry of text messages between Pete Davidson, her new boyfriend and him, which he then went on to post publicly. 
which I don't think obviously Pete meant for them to be posted publicly, but there they were posted. He started off by saying, hey, man, you know, she's a great mom. And why don't we try to have a conversation? Why don't we just talk to each other? Maybe why don't you try to get some help? But basically, Kanye was sort of baiting him and ended up getting Pete sort of upset and emotional. And Pete ends up saying, hey, I'm in bed with with your wife. And of course, Kanye, in his brand of messages, kept referring to Kim as his wife, which is she really his wife anymore when they're divorced? You know, not really, right? But the whole thing really kind of had me thinking about what is it like to continue to be co-parenting with a narcissist? And I just thought this is such a good lesson for all of you out there that are trying to co-parent with a narcissist. And I thought, what better way to draw attention on the do's and don'ts of co-parenting with a narcissist and a good lesson in what to do and what not to do when you're trying to co-parent with a narcissist. Apparently, Kim and Kanye do not have a structured parenting agreement in place. That's a big no-no, for one thing. You definitely want to have a structured parenting agreement in place. You really shouldn't even be separating without a structured parenting agreement in place. You shouldn't even be living in separate houses without a structured parenting agreement in place. You really need to have a very, very specific parenting agreement in place. It should be as specific as you possibly can. So that is a lesson in what to do. Number one, to do. Do not move out without a structured parenting agreement in place if possible. Number two, don't have your significant other be trying to talk to your new boyfriend, be trying to talk to your ex-husband and intervening on your behalf like that, especially be saying, hey, I'm in bed with your wife and sending photos of you like in naked in bed. That is so much of an instigation, right? And here he is basically baiting Kanye. Not good. I mean, and Kanye is kind of baiting him. And what does that do? Number one, it gives Kanye narcissistic supply. Number two, all kinds of trial exhibits potentially down the road, which is not going to be good for Kim because if they end up having some kind of trial, over the custody, all of this is going to come to light. All this flurry of text messaging, everything that's going back and forth here ends up being potential trial exhibits. It's not going to be good for Kim. And frankly, all this stuff that Kanye has been posting, this diarrhea of the mouth and everything that he's been posting is going to be something that can be used against him too. Remember that anything that you put your hand to is a potential trial exhibit, you know, and all that stuff becomes leverage, things that can be used against you. And I have a whole video on that, which you can definitely check out. This is the real leverage against narcissists, which I highly recommend that you check out as well. These are the things that end up being used against you. And another thing that they should be doing and that you could be doing if you're dealing with a narcissist is instead of back and forth using texts and things like that, is they could use one form of communication. And I do highly recommend if you are dealing with a co-parent who's a narcissist, is use something like an app. You know, there's a lot of different apps out there that you can use that are specifically designed for co-parenting. And I highly recommend that if you are in a court battle, that you have the court actually order that you use the app, because that way, if they don't use the app, 
you can actually file something with the court that says, hey, they're not using the app. And you can actually order that the court make them use the app rather than, you know, all these different ways that they can like make your life miserable. And, you know, how they do, they, they use 50 different ways to communicate with you to make your life miserable. So I would say that playing all this out in the public eye is actually just giving Kanye a forum for his narcissistic supply. Baiting is, is also a form of narcissistic supply. By taking the bait, they're giving him narcissistic supply. And then the reaction, it's also all kinds of things that people can be using as court, as trial exhibits, all those sorts of things, all kinds of do's and don'ts in this particular situation, fatal errors that can potentially be used in court 